Well, everyone wanted to go to China at that time, and it was impossible because they were not giving visas at all. Um, I think uh, there were perhaps a few people got in. They tended to be people who were sympathetic to the regime. I had been applying for a long time through a travel agency in China. I confess I did not say I was a journalist. I went in as a uh, as a rich, uh, untrue, amateur archaeologist. Partly true. When we got to Xi'an, as you know, the, the museum in Xi'an is a remarkable place. And this was, I mean, I'm sure it's even more remarkable now. Being a quote-unquote archaeologist, I, I really wanted to see the museum. I really did want to see the museum. But I, and uh, nobody had the key. The, the, the Red Guards who were running the, that area, no one had the key. And they sent someone for a key. And they brought a man with the key, who was an older man, who had clearly been beaten. And he was the curator, or the director of the museum. And he was being pushed along by a couple of 18-year-old kids. And uh, there was a lot of exchange of, of talk with them. And I asked the guide, who was reluctant to translate, and uh, finally did. Um, uh, I think in, in a sanitized translation. Um, he said, the director is going to ask you some questions about the pieces that you see in the museum. Um, and I said, fine, but frankly, I have a lot of questions I would, I'm sure I would want to ask. And he said to me, in a very um, stiff way, he said, um, my colleagues here want to make sure you are an archaeologist. <laughs> um, I figured my cover was broken. <laughs> and, and in any case, we walked through. And, and I was able to be convincing enough, because this, this quite lovely man who, who was just scared out of his wits, um, was asking me questions about particular pieces. You know, what do you think this is? What period do you think this is from? And as I said, my, my little knowledge of Chinese history and archaeology uh, served me well enough to pass the test. Did you have a plan B? Did you just work? No, no plan B. No, 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 plan B. No, 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 no. I mean, I couldn't have had to say, well, plan B is I'm going to, I am actually a basketball player. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, plan A was plan B, C, and D. Serious moments. There were some funny moments, too. Um, although at the time it wasn't funny. I was taken on a tour of a... Um, Industrial Museum, Museum of Industrial Achievement or something by the <clears throat> um, people's soldiers, peasants, and students. And there were various bits and pieces of machines and tractors and military stuff and all kinds. And uh, Somebody pointed, one of the, the guide pointed this tractor. And there it said on it, you know, Massey Ferguson made in Canada or something on this tractor. So this was pointed as one of the achievements of <laughs> revolution. I was stupid enough to say, well, it's a very good tractor, I'm sure, but, but that has been imported from the West. Whereupon I was arrested. And literally frog marched back to the hotel, to the lobby of the hotel. Um, a woman arrived, a very severe woman, um, 
and she, uh, it was explained to me that I was being placed on trial in the hotel lobby for sedition and insulting the people's achievements. And so they set this, she sits up on a little raised dais on a chair. I sit down below. I've got my witnesses, the, the witnesses, again, of my crime uh, around me. And um, she said, what do you have to say for yourself? And as just I opened my mouth, I, I said, I think there's been a... T Shut up! <laughs> I said, no, no. I think there's been some... T Shut! And, and she became more and more severe. And the people around me became more and more severe. It was... Um, have you ever read Alice in Wonderland? You remember Alice in Wonderland? That's... I felt like I'd fallen down the rabbit hole. And um, she said, I will give you one more chance. <laughs> and I said, thank you. I only want to say that I did not mean any... Shut up! The guide sneaks behind me and puts it in and says, just admit your guilt and say you are terribly sorry and that you will never do it again. So she said, I mean this, one more chance. And I said, I am guilty. I have insulted the people's machines. I, I went on, I got quite eloquent about how awful I was and how ill-intentioned I was. And I finished by saying, however, I'm here to learn and I would be, to be open and really understand. And she just smiled and everybody else smiled. And then they got up and they shook my hand. They said, very good. That was very good. Uh, so you understand what I mean by Alice in Wonderland. I mean, I found, I finally understood the music and was able to dance to the music. There were very touching moments. We were out in, I was out in, on the edge of a commune. Um, um, somewhere near Sion, I think. I, I don't remember. And uh, we were being shown around the farm. And taken into someone's house and taken into someone else's house. And the people were very poor. They seemed to have enough to eat. A very simple kind of diet. And as I was, we were leaving, the woman of the house said uh, something to the guide. And he sort of said, you know, and as we were, and uh, she was very, she was very respectful of him, but just kept repeating. And I said, "Well, what's she saying?" She said, "She would like you to stay for a meal." And I said, "No, we don't." I said, "Well, when I said yes, well, clearly she understood me saying yes. I, w I would like to. Uh, I mean, she just beamed, and the whole family beamed." And they went out and they killed a the chicken, which clearly was a very valuable commodity for that family. They might have had that once a week or once every couple of weeks or something like that for this. And she made this little feast in this very modest house. Now, it, was, it was the most touching thing. It was wonderful. Um, I've not been back to China. I really should go. I'd love to go back. I'm afraid I'm going to be looking at... Uh, not at China, but at uh, Cleveland and Pittsburgh and uh, Amsterdam and Buffalo. I mean, I think that it's the changes are uh, a little too rapid for my uh, for my taste, perhaps. And back then, you were uh, an observer, a passerby. Did you imagine what it would be like uh, if uh, you were to stay?
to uh, you were you were one of those people who had to live there. Oh, I could not even contemplate it. I would have been in jail within ten minutes and possibly dead within twenty. <laughs> The sooner you get rid of the totalitarian uh, regimes, the better it is for everyone. Um, uh, I think I, all, all the countries you talk about, I probably know Vietnam better than most. Uh, the people who who fomented that revolution were, were communists, no question. They were playing on a deep, deep-seated Vietnamese desire uh, to resist foreigners of every kind, whether they're Chinese, French, or American. And I think that's one reason why the, the revolution, if we call it that, in Vietnam succeeded, was that even people who did not believe in communism believed in Patriots. their v Vietnamese, their, their Vietnamese-ness. This was stronger than any ideology, any anything, and uh, and the Vietnamese have their own ways. And they have their own way of changing their lives uh, that are not necessarily violent ways. And I think another generation disappears from uh, from Hanoi, from the Politburo, or whatever they call it these days. Um, there's going to be for more forward progress, more freedom, much more now than anyone contemplated there would be 25 years ago, certainly. Uh, and when uh, Doi Moi came you know, when, in, in Vietnam, when they um, um, kind of allowed entrepreneurship to uh, develop as a state policy, I mean, the speed with which it took over was that, you know, essential you know, Vietnamese sense of hard work, industry, entrepreneurship just came right to the fore. And that, it's a country I'm particularly fond of, people I'm particularly fond of in Vietnam. Uh, have had a very rough, here, rough history, but managed to survive it. Uh, they don't maintain old enmities. Uh, the Americans make much more of the Vietnam War than any Vietnamese ever does. It was just another passing bad moment in a long history of bad moments. When did you smoke here for a cigarette? A cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably in my 20s. I was working a night shift in Reuters in London, and that's what got me smoking, I think. I wish I'd never had, never started. <laughs> and uh, oh, is, uh, why Rothman? Uh, some uh, loyalty to my root, Canadian roots. Uh, it's been a very interesting run, though, how, however, and uh, a lot of fun. A lot of, not of things that weren't so much fun, but the things that were. Uh, outweigh the things that weren't. When you visited China, were there a lot of smokers? Uh, oh, everyone, everyone smoked. I remember the brand I smoked in China, Pandas. Uh, I, I think it's still there. Really? Yeah. But you couldn't buy... I think they only came in very small packets of sort of five or, five or six, or a tin of 500. I've never, it's like a, like, a, like a candy box. It was a round tin. And wherever I went, I was carrying this tin box of pandas. I think to a large degree, Americans, and even those, and maybe particularly those in positions of high office, have an extraordinary absence of curiosity about the rest of the world. I think to our loss, to our great loss in this country. Um, there's so little knowledge, so little curiosity. I can understand little knowledge. I can't understand absence of curiosity about other cultures. But uh, that's one of the prices that 
you pay, I guess, in a very rich, very diverse continental country that um, the country becomes a universe in itself and things that happen outside of the universe are too far, too strange, too foreign. It's a pity. I think that people who come from small countries have much greater curiosity <coughs> about the world around them. You do feel a certain affiliation uh, for this country and for New York City. Of course City. I do. Of course. This is my home. I've been lived here a long time. I, <coughs> I think it is, without question, the most extraordinary place on earth. Mm -hmm. This city. This city. And this, this country? Is, this city is the world. It's everything. It is heaven and hell in one glorious cocktail. You like it because it's extreme? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>